Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036359, 0703 768119. Email address lsmedia at or visit our website at www.livingseed.org. Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. to continue and just finish up uh, with our outline on marriage by looking at the various ways by which God speaks to us. But we are just going to do it very, very briefly because by God's grace and mercy, we are also going to be presenting to you some of our brethren who will be coming to share with us their own experience on how God led them on this path and on this journey and how they entered into their own marital union. Praise the Lord. But before we invite them very quickly, uh, can I ask, do we have the outline? We do. Aha, some people are saying no. Now we discovered that some of us we collected more than one. Can I beg you to release if you have more than one with you? We printed enough for everyone who is here who has registered and we discovered that so many people don't have a copy. How the copies finish, we don't know, but we feel some of us have more than one copy with us. Will you be Christian enough to release those copies with you? So if you have more than one copy, can you please release it? All right, thank you. I'm seeing some people already releasing the ones they have that is more than one. If you have more than one copy, can you please release it? Um, can I ask the ushers to help us collect it? Just move around. If you have more than a copy with you, just lift it up. The ushers will be collecting it from you. Thank you very much as you do that. And for those of us who don't have, as you see the ushers, just lift up your hand so that they can place it in your hand. Is that all right? Okay. Praise the Lord. Father, we want to ask again that you will please help us in this little time that we have to again look into the issues of marriage. Please help our hearts. Grant us understanding. Remove every preconceived idea, preconceived notions, traditional beliefs that has hindered your word from coming to us. We ask again, Lord, that you will demolish and remove them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Cause, O oh Lord, that your word will come to us expressly and that we will enter into your desired purpose for us concerning marriage in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yesterday we briefly looked at what marriage is. We looked at who not to marry and who to marry and we began to look at the condition of heart that we must have in order to receive the word of God. Today very quickly just to pick those points on various ways by which God speaks to us on the issue of marriage. Now like we said yesterday it is not when it gets to the issue of marriage 
that you now insist that you want to hear God. As if God will now be speaking to you in another way. The same way God has been relating with you, God has been showing you his words, God has been speaking to you, it's the same way God will speak to you when you get to this junction of marriage. But we just quickly want to look at these ways that God speaks. And like our brother began to share with us under the discipleship seminar, he said he had the still small voice. He had God speak to him to say, this is your wife. And he did not jump immediately. He told you it took time before he eventually went to propose. So the first thing I want to talk about is the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. The inner witness of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 10, Jesus began to talk and say that his sheep hear his voice and they follow him. So first for you to know that if you are a sheep, if you are a child of God, God is very interested in speaking to you. And that if you are actually his sheep, you will hear him. You will hear his voice. The Holy Spirit ministers to our spirit and he speaks to us concerning our lives, concerning marriage, and concerning every other thing that we need to do. Psalm 32 verse 8 Psalm 32 verse 8, he promised that he will lead and guide us in the way that we should go. So God already gave us a promise that he will guide us. He will not leave us stranded. God is not planning to leave us stranded at this junction of marriage. He wants to lead. He wants to guide. He wants to take us into that which he has planned and proposed for our lives. And I'd like you to know that he is still very much in that business. God still speaks. God still instructs. God still directs. The Holy Spirit lives in you and he wants to speak to you about every matter of your life. Your mind needs to be saturated with the word of God in order to be able to differentiate between the voice of the Holy Spirit and that which is of your reasoning. If you don't fill your heart with the word of God, you will not be able to hear him when he speaks to you. You will be confused whether it is actually God that is speaking to you or you are actually hearing another voice. So we are noting again that you can't throw away the word of God. As a child of God, as a son of the Most High, you must keep studying to show yourself approved unto God so that you can be able to rightly divide the word of truth. The Bible also tells us in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 30, Isaiah 30 verse 21, it says, And thine ears shall hear a word behind you, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. So we see God very, very interested in speaking to you and giving direction and instructions for our lives. Now, I discovered that many, many times when young ones are involved in marriage, and they are either entering into courtship and you are asking, ah, are you sure it is God? What was always the response? I have peace about it. And I keep asking, did you have trouble before that time? And that has seemed like a regular answer that you receive anytime you are asking whether you are sure that God is the one inside of this. You say, hey, but I have peace about it. But then a scripture in Isaiah 32. Can you quickly look at Isaiah 32? Because I keep imagining in my heart that it is this scripture that is being brought out of context to keep giving us an answer that we readily want to hear about the situation. Isaiah 32 verse 17. 
The Bible says, and the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. It is the work of righteousness. It is your righteous living and being in tune with Christ that will lead to a peace that reigns inside your heart. So when you are being asked to say, are you sure it is God? You say, well, I have peace about it. And definitely if it is something that you have always desired and longed for, you do not have peace inside your mind. Whether it is God or not, you just tell yourself and assure yourself with that, well, I have peace about this thing and I don't see why I should be troubled about it. But then just to help you know that there is the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. But so that you will not be confused, it is aligned with the word of God. God will not be telling you now. And be, you say you have a witness in your spirit to go and marry an unbeliever. Will that be God? Eh? Or to go and marry a married person? Then you know that that is not God. But if you have not aligned your heart with the word of God, definitely you will not even think or know that God does not desire that for you in marriage. Number two, very quickly, I want to be very fast about it so that our brethren can have some little time to also share with us. Some of these things they will be telling us practically how God led and guided them. Number two, dreams, visions, and trances. God uses these methods to get our attention, especially when your heart is far and when it needs to speak to you. Dreams are good. They are all right. There are those that God, it has been established in their Christian life that this is how God speaks to them. It is through dreams. But very many of us, we have never dreamt one dream oh, that came true. But suddenly you will dream that you are in a wedding dress and this brother is in suit. And that automatically tells you that that is the person to marry. So most times when people come up and say, well, I dreamt and God told me that is my wife. I say, tell me another dream that has come true before, aside from this one. And most times, they are neither Joseph nor Josephine. They just remain themselves, dreamers. But for us to know that God speaks to us through dreams, God speaks through visions, God speaks through trances. But these only come as remedial ways when God has not caught your attention. God has been trying to speak to you. God has been trying to instruct you, but you are not hearing. So he waits for when you are at rest and at peace, when you are asleep and all the other faculties are resting. Then he comes to speak to you through dreams, hoping and believing that when that comes, you will arise and come back to him to confirm that which he is saying. So don't run on one leg of a dream that you dreamt and you think that is enough to guide you concerning marriage. Did you understand? For every dream, it needs an interpretation. Is that not so? And every interpretation that will come to your, for your dream must be in line with the word of God. It must not be separate from the word of God. And of course, we now come to that number three, which says the word of God. Now, for us to know that this is the most authentic way by which God speaks. God speaks through his word. The Bible actually says in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was what? Eh? You are not reading your Bible, so many of you are not even sure. But God speaks to us through his words. And you remember this morning at the devotional charge, a brother was talking to us about personal quiet time. Personal time alone with God when you engage the word of God for your life. And through that, God speaks to men. 
God speaks to us concerning our lives. God speaks to us concerning our future. But if we have not become friendly with the word of God, how then can you authenticate what you feel or believe is coming to you from God? In Psalm 119 and verse 105, it says, The word is a lamp unto my feet and is a light unto my path. God can bring scriptures to your heart to confirm or disapprove of the person that you are thinking of. Beware of interpreting the scriptures with impure hearts. Beware of it. When your heart is not right with God, you cannot interpret the word of God correctly or effectively. But every other thing that we're talking about, the inner witness, the dreams, the visions, the trances, must find their root in the word of God. That's why we are saying is the most authentic. And honestly, for you to know that God speaks for those who have ears to hear. God speaks. He guides. He instructs through his word for as many that seek to know him from there. Amen? The word of God. The authentic way that God speaks to us concerning marriage. And then we spoke about godly counsel from elders and from disciples. Again, for you to know that the elders and disciples are only there to guide you concerning what God has spoken to you. The Holy Spirit can confirm what God is saying to you through the elders. When you are inside a situation, many times, you are not hearing well. You are consumed with that time, with that circumstance in your life. But an elder or someone that has oversight over you is able to see the whole picture and to see beyond you so he can guide you aright. Can I ask you a question? Who are the best football players in the world? Eh? I didn't hear. Those who are watching on TV or by the stand, they are the best footballers. They know who you should have passed to. They know the best person to have scored the goal. But go and put them on the field. They say, Kai, my father will have scored that goal. Because you are seeing the entire field you are seeing beyond the person that is carrying the ball at that time. That's the work of the elders. You that you are consumed in the issues of marriage, you are only seeing yourself and this sister or this brother that has consumed your heart. But the elder who is not inside is able to see above and beyond you. And so they are able to guide you to confirm whatever revelation or whatever you feel God is speaking to you. So what does that mean? Don't run. Just don't run away because one revelation or one insight has come concerning who to marry. Submit it to elders. Submit it to disciples. Submit it to older Christians who can help and guide you in such situations. We have discovered many times just like we are studying in the Bible studies, that when we get to this junction of marriage, it's a time when the strategy of the devil works most because he isolates us for slaughter. That's the time you will not want to share or discuss with anybody that will have given you help. You only want to hear from those who will encourage whatever you are doing, whether it is right or wrong. And finally, we talked about prophecy. And that this can also come to confirm what God is saying to you. You must be careful to test every spirit to know whether it is of God. So you go to a, 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 a fellowship or a service. And one man says, all oh, brothers who are not married, stand up. 
All sisters are normally stand up. And then he says, oh yeah, I prophesy. Begin to catch yourselves. It's not that kind of prophecy we are talking about. The prophecy that comes to you must be from tested men of God who have also spoken the very heart and mind of God. That's why we said, test every spirit and see whether it is of God. Acts 13 that we mentioned there was talking about the church that was in Antioch when certain prophets and teachers came and said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have for them. In conclusion, we are saying Christian marriage is instituted and ordained by God for life and it is still there to do us part. Since to have a sustainable marital union, you must have a solid foundation that will withstand all the winds and storms of life. Please note that every marriage has its storms, has its winds that blows against it. It is only those that are built on the solid rock that can withstand those storms. Take heed to the word of God, which is the manufacturer's manual, and it must be given preference over cultures and traditions. It's important again for us to mention this because we discovered that as many of us came for counseling, this issue of culture and tradition was still very strong in our hearts. Let the word of God Take preference over your culture and tradition. Concerning this word of God, it is true for all time. It does not change. Now we are saying that may the Lord help you to take heed to this truth. It's not enough for you to just hear. Note that everything we have said thus far has been from the word of God. Has it not been from there? May God help you to align your heart to the word of God. May God help you that you will not miss it at this junction. So that what God has determined to do with your lives, especially concerning marriage, he will fulfill it in the name of Jesus Christ. First, that you will allow him. You will not struggle with him. You will not hold on to your own beliefs but that you will allow God to do what he has said and what he has promised. Praise the Lord. Now, very quickly, I'd like to introduce our brethren who will be coming to share with us. And they will just share with us how God helped them at this junction. How God led and guided them. And how elders, disciples, those who had spiritual oversight over them, how they also helped to confirm what God spoke to them and what God revealed unto them. Praise the Lord. I'd like to invite first our sister, Sister Ebun Ekoja. She's been married for 19 years and she's going to be sharing with us Can I call Brother Emmanuel Abutu to also come? When I was saying for how long has he been married? He said 20 months. So that I can be loud. If I said two years or one year now, you say, hey, just that. Praise the Lord. But Emmanuel will share with us how God helped him. His wife is there. She's been praying for me that I won't call her. I think her prayer is working because time is running. But let me just invite Brother Emmanuel and he will be sharing with us. Wait, don't worry. It's all right. So let me invite her to come and sit here. Praise the Lord. You're welcome. God bless you. So they will be sharing with us now we are bringing them so that you will see that all that we have been sharing and talking about is happening in the lives of those who allow God. And if you also will allow God, you will experience the same thing in your own life. May the Lord help you as you listen. 
In Jesus' name. But I manner. Good evening. Amen. Um, I will just try to tell the story and trust that God will help you see how the word comes alive. Um, the journey to pick a wife started sometime in 2005. I was at home and my sister got me very angry and I almost slapped her. And I finished washing and I finished with that and came to sit down to wash. And as I was washing, I started praying that Father, how far with a life partner? <laughs> and I was washing and God told me that you, who will give you a life partner? So if it were your wife, who did what your sister just did? That's how you'd have slapped her. And the rebuke was very sharp, and I knew that I did what was wrong. Um, God was just pointing to anger as an issue in my life. And he, the instruction was very clear. You need work on yourself, not a life partner now. And I took that very seriously. So character formation became my priority and I started asking God to help me. And as I continued with that and I grew, um, I decided to begin to read very early on the subject. So I read three books that helped me. Um, I started reading No More Two very early. Uh, I read the parts for the singles, there is the part B that is for the marriage. I left that at a point. And another book, The Dignity of Manhood. When I encounter that book, it's a book that every male must read. And it's not too late. It's, but it's not too early for you to start reading. And those two books led very strong impression on my heart what the marriage, uh, what the marital life should be like and what the responsibility of a man is in his home. When I took the third book, Building a Fulfilling Marital Relationship, I could not go beyond the portion that um, emphasized the need that a man must have a vision. You must have a work. You must be busy doing something in the house, you know, doing something for God, for him, for you to qualify to get a wife. Each time I pick that book and I get to that point, it led me only to pray that God should help me, show me, you know, the vision for my life and the pop, pop, my purpose in Christ became a priority over anything marriage. And that kept me for a long time waiting and trusting God. When it was time, um, God began to I had an experience with a sister. I prayed. I followed all the principles I have learned much earlier. And one evening she told me, my brother, I'm sorry. I have another person I want to marry. I will not marry you. Um, I, was, I was not happy. But um, I only managed to thank God for her response. And then... I knelt down in my room and I was praying. I was just thanking God. And in the process, a, a scripture popped up in my mind that says that he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for you, will he not along with him give you all things? And when I got that question, I had to pause and look for it in scriptures. And I answered the Lord to say that day that, Father, I believe that the most difficult thing for you to have given to me would have been your son. And if you have given me your son, giving me a wife wouldn't be a problem. And then I was comforted and I moved on. About a year later, 
about a year later, um, I have been thinking whether I was either driving or I was, had, I was taking my bath when um, a voice came clearly in my spirit that Onya Lonye is the woman I have placed, I have made for you. Um, sincerely, I was not as joyful as you are. <laughs> because I just met this lady a few weeks ago, a few months um, before that time, and she called me just to ask for a projector. She was a sister coordinator and she needed a projector. I was not available. I sent someone to attend to her. And then she called back again to say she was grateful. And um, we began to just talk on phone. She was on IT. I, and listen, now what were we saying? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, it's not the kind of talk you are thinking. <laughs> Amen. And so I hardly knew her. That was the point I was going to make. And when she returned back to campus, um, I remember she told me that she came to greet me and me, I didn't know her. And what I told her that evening, we're chatting. I said, well, on Sunday again, just, greet, just come and tell me your name. I will try to note you, which she did. And sincerely, I forgot her the next time I saw her. And so we were not close. And so I was not comfortable <laughs> even with the, with the thoughts or with the inspiration I got. And like every other thought, as a young man, there were so many persons who came to mind. And I had this policy to put it to test of time. So I just allowed it. And over time, this, this thought will not just leave me. And then one day I say, God, please, I don't want to go and ask anybody. And the person just says, uh, no, I want to be sure that it is you. And if I'm convinced it is you, Lord, I will go. And that struggles went on until one day I was praying about it. And God said, it is me. Who told you that I, if I spared not my son, will I not give you all things? I am the one who is saying, go, don't be afraid. And I said, okay. The next thing I had to do was to talk to my disciple about it. Um, and he said, let us pray. And I allowed it at that point. And once I was convinced, I submitted it to him. And we kept praying about it. And uh, after some time, he asked me, how far have you talked to her about it? I said, no, I have not. I'm waiting. And he now said, I can now go. And even looking for an opportunity to talk to her was a problem because we were not friends. I remember just calling her to say, we we'll need to talk whenever you are available. One fateful day, I was very busy preparing for another friend's wedding. When she called me to tell me that she was available to see me that day, can we see? And she came to my office, and I was wondering if it was a good time <laughs> to say what was on my mind. And um, I sensed the Lord telling me, just tell her, it's not a big deal. You must not go and get a, create a scene because you wanted to propose. And so um, I told her exactly what I told her. Well, this is what I told her, that um, I'm sensing in my heart. <laughs> Amen. Listen, I don't have time, please. Um, I told her that I, I'm sensing in my heart that um, God would have us start a home. It is my personal it is what I think God has said to me. And I have subjected it to my disciples' um, confirmation and with his, um, with his, uh, his, with his um, <laughs> consent. I, I feel I should let you know. But please note that it is a proposal. It is God who works in us 
both to will and to do of his good pleasure. If the Lord bids you to come, I'll be happy to have you as my life partner. That is all I told her. Um, I observed that she got busy doing something, which I asked her months later, what were you doing on, with your hand on the table? And she just said to me that day that I have heard you. I also told her that, please, if I don't talk about this again, it's because I believe that you are praying and that once you are sure, the Lord, you, I trust that you will come back to me and let me know. And I was sincere about it. I was not going to follow up. I was not going to pester her. I was not going to be calling her always. And she understood with me. Um, that was in May. In, in September, one good day, she called me. And she told me that, please, can we see? But this time, it will not be in your office. I said, eh. That scared me because maybe she was... Um, ensuring that if it's a no, um, my countenance will not drop in the midst of my colleagues. So I said, okay, no problem. We went to a restaurant, a very busy restaurant, and we met there. And then she now told me that um, she has prayed, she was trusting God, and that God has convict, convinced her that she, I am the man she should follow. Now listen, listen, please. I, I, I was happy, um, but in my mind I was saying, Father, could it be this simple? Um, what is the next thing? That was what was running in my mind. When she now shared a challenge, she said she is willing and she is convinced that it is God's will, but long time ago, her parents had warned her that if you are bringing us a husband, please don't bring us a man from Morocco. And it was a big matter for her family. And she also told me that when she felt it was God's will for her, um, she had gone ahead to tell her father that this is what she thinks is God's will for her and that they should pray along with her. And so the matter was already at the family, um, yes, the family was aware and they were already praying. To make matters worse, there was this man of God that the father believed in and wanted to get his, 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 yeah, his counsel on the subject. My, now my wife, uh, then fiance, went with him to seek the counsel. And the man of God only ended up gisting with um, her father how terrible the people from my place were. And she was very discouraged. So when she told me all of this, I told her that God who has begun a good work, he is faithful and he is just to accomplish it to the end. Let's keep praying. I went back to my disciple. I'm almost done. And I told my daddy that, Daddy, oh, this is update. This is what she said. This is, um, this is the challenge. And he comforted me and said, let's keep praying. Barely a month afterwards, um, the man of God, that man of God, um, later I learned was God convinced, God, God convinced him that he was the one at work. So he called the parents of my, of my wife and told them that, see, this thing, I remember the day you came, we were gisting about it and we were seeing how terrible those people were. But the Lord has um, made it clear to him that he is God's way for her. Let her go ahead and say yes to him. So one month later, she said yes to me. And it was official, if you want to say it that way. And we began. And with the help of my disciple and many elders, actually one of the good things God has done for me is to surround me with elders 
who instructs me. And with the council of elders, we continued with prayer. What did we do in our courtship? We studied, we went back to No More Two and began to study very deliberately again. We began to talk frankly about what God has, um, the principles God has laid down in that book. We began to build friendship. We began to communicate. One of the reasons why I was going to argue with God over her was that just being friends, one of those days I asked her, so what is your CGPA? And she refused. She refused to tell me. And I felt that ah, that lady is secretive. So when God was telling me initially, I said, Kai, that lady is secretive. I don't want, you know. But as we started courtship, God began to talk, teach us how to talk to one another openly. And we began to build friendship. We began to under, identify the grace of God in each other's lives. We began to, I began to share the work or what I perceive is God's will for my life. And, um, uh. and then finally, we began to learn from senior friends, deliberately going to our senior friends. I introduced her, this is the woman God is giving to me as a wife. And they began to cancel me and we were in it till it was time to set dates for wedding. Um, we courted for about two years. Well, not up to two years. And um, now we are married. Praise the Lord. I wish I could talk about wedding, but um, let's leave that for now. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Did you see that proposal was very simple? And instead of you to listen and get expo, you are making noise. All right. Praise the Lord. I wanted his wife to say one or two words. Praise the Lord. I think I'm in trouble this night. <laughs> um, I would like to talk briefly because my husband has said a lot already. As a single lady, we had, I had this group of friends that we related with and we encouraged ourselves to walk with God and one thing we always encouraged ourselves also about was that you will not miss it even in marriage because even when we came for meetings for student congress they always tell you that in marriage you must not miss it because the devil is looking for opportunities to get hold of the believer. Hallelujah. When my husband proposed, we were not close. We only spoke once in a while. We only interacted once in a long while. And as he told you, I got to know him when we needed projector for a program. So I got his contact and called him. He was not in town, so he sent someone to come with a projector. So after the program, I just called to say thank you and all of that. So we did not know. We only spoke on phone once in a while until we eventually got to know ourselves. When he proposed, I didn't pray about it initially because number one, I said, ah, my father has warned us that we should not bring anybody from that part of Idoma home as a life partner. So I didn't want to pray about it. 
I, I, I wanted to leave it. So it took some time before I started praying about it because I spoke with my disciple about it. And of course, um, some of my friends that we used to study the Bible together and pray together. So they encouraged me to pray. And I, also, I learned that as you pray more, you learn to hear God more. So no matter how minute you think a matter is, no matter how unserious, it is important to seek the face of God concerning it. And also, I didn't like him also because of his height. <laughs> I had this idea of uh, my husband should be taller and light skinned. So when he came in the form of Emmanuel Abutu, I, I didn't know what to do until I got the counsel to pray. So I saw the face of God and it was not long after when God told me that he is the one. He first told me that Ima Abutu is my son. So I said, okay, I, I decided to pay more attention and pray deliberately about him. Then he told me that he is the one. And then again, because I was afraid that my parents were going to object, God addressed my fears. He told me he was going to level the mountains. He was going to make this crooked path straight. So that was, for me, confirmation from his word. He spoke about it. He told me continually that it is Ima Abutu. So even when I told my father, because I didn't say yes to him, I wanted my parents to be, to be involved in the whole process. So I told my parents about it when I was sure um, it was God. When I told them, my father said, what? Onya Lonye, I've been warning you. But I just told him that I believed that was the will of God for me. And then I remember um, at different instances where he called me and said, um, haven't you seen any other person other than this Ima Abutu. <laughs> so I just, I continued to tell him that I felt that was the will of God. And he said, okay, that they were going to pray about it. So confirmations kept coming. Then eventually they released me to say yes to him. And that was when we started courtship. Praise the Lord. I hope you noted that she didn't become a Christian when marriage issues came. Did you notice that? They knew in her house that she was a Christian. Some of us, we have never shown any character of Christ at home before. And then when it comes to marriage, you get so arrogant when your parents insist and say, no, this is what they want. And you now start raising prayer points. The second thing I wanted you to please note was that she had this group of friends that they prayed together. And they kept praying for one another that they will not miss it at this junction. That this truth that they keep hearing when they come for students' congress must be fulfilled in their own lives. I don't know those who are your own friends. I don't know those you consult, those you speak to when you get to this junction. But I'm praying that you will learn from these practical life ex examples so that your own lives might be fashioned out well. Amen. Let me invite Sister Ebuya Koja 
because of our time. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to share just like I had been told concerning how I got married, the leadings of God and all that happened. Now, I will not be able to talk about that without giving you an insight to my background. I'm a product of a broken home. I, I didn't grow up with my father and my mother. I only had my mother bringing us up. But as a child, I never saw my dad. I didn't have a father figure. I didn't know what it meant to have a father. And I grew up like that until I was in my secondary school. By the time I was in my form four, my father came in from outside the country. My mother had told us so many things about my dad and they were not very pleasant. So I grew up hating everything marriage. I didn't want to marry at all because of what I saw in my own life as I was growing up and then the families around me. And when my father came from outside, he looked for us in Lagos, got to locate where we were, took us to where he was staying. By now he had married another woman. And on three different occasions, he tried to molest me. But on those three various occasions, a divine hand delivered me. I can't go into details. Now, when I entered into the university, I entered as an unbeliever. But somehow in my part two, I gave my life to Christ during the holiday. It was a struggle with my mother trying to help and all of that. Now, as I gave my life to Christ and I went back to school, it was a different thing for me entirely. Knowing the Lord Jesus meant so much to me. God became my father. He became everything to me. I, I, I loved him so passionately that there was nothing about me that I would not discuss with him. Now, as I entered the campus, I was very excited because of my newfound love. I loved Jesus with all of my heart and I really wanted to live for him. But I had a challenge. On the campus, I had an experience of brothers coming around to visit and, you know, they just kept coming. One of my friends, a sister said, this is how brothers used to do. When they start coming around you, the next thing is that they are going to ask for your hand in marriage. I said, me, I'm not ready for marriage. I want to know the Lord Jesus Christ. I have not yet known him. And I don't want anything to interrupt this rapport I'm having with him. So, because I didn't know how to handle those brothers coming, I decided that I would withdraw. I would no longer continue to be born again. That I will become unborn again. Since I was the one that told Jesus to come into my heart, I will ask him to leave me because I didn't want to insult any of those brothers. I took them as children of God. As an unbeliever, when a young man comes around me, I knew how to handle him. I didn't have time for all those kind of things. So I withdrew from fellowship. I stopped having my quiet time. I stopped everything so that I would be relieved and delivered from that pressure. But in my part two, I was quoting with a sister. We knew in the secondary school, and then because of ill health, I caught up with her in the university. But she, so she had an accommodation, and she took me in. 
Now, there was a program on campus organized by the FCS. And our daddy in the Lord was the speaker of that meeting. And you know, I have already decided not to continue in the, in the faith. But this sister that was quoting me, she took it upon herself to cook the minister's meals. So every time that she has finished, a brother will come from the hostel to come and collect the minister's food and take down. And I will join her to work. But there was this particular period, no brother came. This sister sat down. She's of blessed memory now. She bowed her head and she prayed. Then she said, Sister Patience, you have to take this food down for me. I said, no, I, won't. I can't go. She said, you will go. I agreed. I took the food. As I was going, I began to pray. I have not prayed for a long time, oh, but that day I began to pray. I said, oh God, let me see a brother that was coming to pick this food, to come and collect it and take it down to the hostel, to the male hostel. I prayed, nothing happened. And then I went to the hostel. I prayed, I said, Lord, don't allow anybody be in that hostel so that I can just sneak in, drop the food and run away. But when I went into the, ho in, into the room, the room was jam-packed, full of brothers. They were discussing with somebody, I don't know the person. I dropped the food. I was about sneaking out when a voice stopped and said, Sister, come. I looked. I didn't know the, I, I didn't know the face. The president of our fellowship asked me, said, have you come for the meetings? I said, no. Why should I come? He said, ah, they said, ah, something wonderful is happening and you did not come. So the servant of God called me. He asked me my name. I gave it to him. He told me, he asked me um, one or two other things about me and I told him. And at that point, a relationship began. Whenever, when he came to Naraguta Country Club to take a meeting with women at GLOW, he was talking on Deborah, God's pattern for Christian service. He sent for me and I went down. That was when I heard the word of God. In a way, I have, it has never happened to me before. Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, he dealt with the matter of Deborah's intimacy with God. He dealt with the fact that Deborah had a home and how that home was. He dealt with issues concerning Deborah. My eyes opened. My life changed. And from there, I continued. So, you know, I was reconnected back to the Lord. And I began to grow. In my final year, as I kept on standing for the Lord, now I knew how to handle the opposite sex whenever they tried to bring pressures on me. It was not difficult anymore. I would only just let my disciple know and he told me what to do. When in my final year, one day I was having my quiet time and I didn't pray about marriage. And the Lord came. He spoke, he said, you are going to marry a man from Benue State. And he is going to be in the medical line. I said, I was surprised. I didn't understand. But as those things began to happen, as those revelations kept coming, I kept relaying them to him. Now, this happened around the year 1984. And even in that process, different times at different periods, the Lord will come. In fact, there was a day he came, he told me the number of children that I'm going to have. I was surprised. But I kept making sure that I relayed the information back. I had to give you this backdrop so that you will know how discipleship, you know, affected me. How God linked me into it, even in my ignorance, when I was very naive about the whole thing. As I finished my, my undergraduate days, and the Lord told me that he would post me to the north 
for my NYSC. And Kano State came as my call up, you know, when my call up letter came. Everybody was afraid, but I wasn't afraid because he had told me beforehand. While I was there, now, 10, about 10, 11 years had elapsed from the first time the Lord was speaking to me concerning who I would marry until the time that I met my husband for the first time. It was about 11 years. Then, while I was in my NYSC, as I finished and God told me to pick up a job in Kano there, I had various experiences. I had experiences of you know, issues where um, ministers of God wanted to have my hand in marriage. And the Lord had been so gracious to me and so wonderful that before anybody would come to me, he would have told me. He would say, so, 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 pastor is coming to you. I did not send him. Be careful. So when they come, I don't need to go and start praying. I will say, bro, I am not the one you are to marry. The person you are to marry will still come. It's not me. Hold on and wait for your own life partner. Thank God for this wonderful meeting. Thank God for what God is doing. If as a young lady and as a spinster, I did not know how to relate with God and have a, and have a personal devotion and relationship with him, my life would have been wrecked. And I discovered that when a sister has a strong relationship with God, she can deliver brothers from making mistakes even in marriage. In this due of your youth, please engage the Lord as a single lady. Don't take things for granted. Don't allow anything to just happen to you. Now, when I was in Kano, I had pressures and I related everything to him. And there was a time in which um, a minister came to me and brethren, you know, several brethren who were like Jim Jim Christians in Kano then, they were very sure that God wanted this brother and I to get married. And when I prayed, I saw that, you know, I was also having revelations. But I did not understand that some revelations can be environmental. One thing I did, which God helped me, was that any opportunity I had to interact with my disciple, I always relayed everything to him. So I told him this that happened. He sat back and listened to me and listened to me and then he released me back to Kano. When I went back to Kano, every, everything that was about to culminate into a relationship, the whole thing scattered. Everything became rubbished. And when I came and I told him, he asked me, he said, how far with that thing? I told him. He didn't say anything. He kept quiet. I went to God. I said, Lord, why didn't he say anything? And the understanding God told me was that, God gave me was that, because he sees more than I can see, he prayed and ensured that that thing which I was about to enter into, which was a trap, was scattered. Praise the Lord. Discipleship is a wonderful thing. Because what you don't know now, the pit hole you would have entered, somehow God enables those who have an oversight for your life. They can see it and then they can deliberately pray and spoil it. That also helped me in being able to handle other younger lives. Now, in November 1993, he asked me to come down to Boko. The Lord told me also that I will go down to Boko, but that he will bring me back to Kano with my husband. When, we, when I got back to, 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 to Boko, by the year 1996, I first of all had an impression. I saw, I saw the Holy Ghost impress on my spirit the face of my husband. I shared it. And he just encouraged me to keep praying. 
Now, as that impression kept growing, one day as we returned from the discipleship class, Brother Tewase Tagama gave me a ride on his machine then. We were returning home. So I said, Uncle, I have a strange experience. He said, should I tell you what it is? I said, like how? He said, is it not about Brother Ali Ekoja? A year ago, God had told us that he will be your husband. Huh. <laughs> I was amazed. So look at my, you know, look at my father in the Lord. When I discussed with him earlier, he said that he had known that it would be Brother Ali, but that they were watching to see how God was going to happen, how God was going to cause it to happen. And when I told the elder, he said that, ah, they too had already known. But for me, I was only just beginning to have an understanding. So I went on and I kept praying. I said, Lord, I don't understand all of this. And the Lord gave me a scripture. He said, that was in Isaiah 28 verse 29. He said, this also cometh from the Lord of hosts, who is perfect in walking and excellent in counsel. And then he told me again, he said, the government of your home shall be upon my shoulders. I said, but Lord, this brother is from Benue and I am from Akwaibo. You know, that's a cross-cultural thing now. But as I kept praying and we kept praying, we now saw the Lord beginning to cause things to happen. Now, I must not omit something. You know, I told you I came from a broken home. When I returned from Kano in 93 and they took me home, that um, our brother and the wife, I, I, saw, I, saw, I saw a home for the first time. That was my first time of living in a home. You know, when you have a home setting and you see a man and the wife living in such cordial harmony, and though the home was so busy, you could see the love, you could see the fellowship. I quietly learned so much from them. And I began to pray. I said, oh God, please give me a busy home. Give me a husband that I can relate so deeply with, just like I am seeing. Give me a home that resembles this one. And the Lord was very merciful to me. Now, as, as I kept praying and sharing with them, at a point, my husband, who was also on his end, receiving instructions from the Lord concerning marrying me, was also relating everything with our brother. And as time went on, when it was time for him to come and propose to me, he was given the directive to come down. And when he came, I was also set because the Lord had told us everything. And as our disciples, uh, as my disciples prayed, everything was confirmed. So I said yes. And our courtship began. Now, the first time I visited my husband's place, during our courtship it was going to look very rough but the moment my mother-in-law saw me she made an exclamation she said this is the daughter that I should have given birth to but God went and put her in another woman's womb and now God has brought her back to me praise the Lord I was afraid because being a cross-cultural thing, I might have faced rejection at a level. But to God be the glory, I had, I was accepted warmly. And when the time for my uh, traditional wedding came, hmm, that was another thing entirely. But I thank God for discipleship. My father made terrible demands on us. Actually, one of the things he wanted us to give him was a jeep. <laughs> so, 
When we went to visit him, my father in the Lord was with us. He led the team actually. And my biological father said, he doesn't mind. Anytime we have, we have the money, we can come and give it to him and give him that jeep. My father in the Lord stood. He said, he will not have these children marry and enter into debt. And that ground he stood delivered us from what would have become a snare as we took off in our home. Praise the Lord. When we worked to wed, actually it, everything was handled in this place. It was handled by my parents in the Lord. Both our, our father in the Lord and our mother in the Lord. And God visited us. And now, because of God's leading, and because of what God has in store for us, I saw that marrying according to the will of God, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, having people to oversee your life is so crucial that you just cannot go to marriage. I mean, to, you cannot get into marriage just because of what you see going on around. And today, because of what I saw in their home, and because of what I have learnt, my home is such a beautiful place. Now I encourage people to get married. Once you get married correctly, you know that you have a mini heaven upon earth. Every day it is beautiful. On the 17th of April this month, we were 19 years in marriage. And it is as if it was just yesterday. And if God did not arrange that drama for me on campus, for me to click and enter into discipleship, and for me to come this way and to know these wonderful people, I don't know where I would have been today. Because I hated marriage with a passion. And I would not have anything to do with the opposite sex. But to God be the glory. Today is a different story. Praise the Lord. Is marriage good? I know you will say yes. But I hope you heard how it was God that started it and that completed it. Marriage inside Christ is very beautiful. It's very good. Marriage is not just I love him, he loves me, and we got married. Love has to do with just your own affection. Can you allow it to be God's affection that he has put in you? I remember that I had, they talked about an Asian woman and an American woman. And they were asking why the rate of divorce in Asia was very low. But in America, it was very high. And they were asking them, what was the reason? You know what the Asian woman said? He said, Americans marry the man they love. He said, but they love the man they marry. If it is God that is bringing you into that relationship and you believe and trust God and are rested, you are rested in the fact that God means good for you, that love will come from within because it is of God. You will love what God gives you because it's the best for you. But if you base your own decision on just that personal affection, just note that it will soon fizzle away. One day the wine will finish and then you will get back to the very foundation again. I pray that you will have Christ in you who will guide you and who will keep renewing that wine in your marriage when you get there in the name of Jesus Christ. 
We thank our discussants. Thank you very much. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. I want to believe that you have learned a lot. Our sister spoke to us about cross-cultural. Even though our other brethren, both from the same area, but this particular tribe. But did you see how it was handled? It was handled under God. They spent time praying. They spent time with their disciples. And God, who was the one that initiated it, he perfected everything. I pray that you will release everything about your marriage to God and that you will allow him to handle everything and bring you to a place of rest in the name of Jesus Christ. Our time is far spent. Our brother has been very kind. He gave me the extra 30 minutes that the discipleship ate up. Because of that, we will not be able to take questions. But if you have a critical question bothering your heart, the resource persons are there. They will be helping you to handle them. Can we rise up together as we pray? Let's pray together. Let's pray. Please speak to God as you thank God for bringing his word to us and for showing us audiovisual means. We are seeing people who have passed through these things and they are sharing with you how God led them step by step. Can you beg God that you also, you will not miss it. Please pray that you will engage this view of your youth. You will engage it well. Your desire, your affection will be for the Lord. You will trust the Lord with all your heart, not leaning on your own understanding. Our brother was counseling us. He said, look, every brother must go and read the dignity of manhood. Go and pick those materials that God has brought for us at this time. How privileged you are. At our own time, we didn't have such materials. But look at how God has packaged help all around you. Will you pray? That with all these that God has made available, you will not be a disappointment. Your marriage will not bring shame to the name of the Lord. Pray that you will marry well. Father, we want to thank you very much for how you have helped us. Thank you for the instructions that you brought to us concerning marriage. And thank you very much for our brethren who have revealed and exposed their lives unto us to see how God guided and led them into this holy estate. Lord, we want to beg you over these lives that you will preserve them in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, please help our students and youths that they will engage this view of their youth to know you, to recognize how you speak to them, to indeed live the life of Christ that will be revealed to all, seeing and knowing that when they get to this junction of marriage, you will be there to guide them into it in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we are pleading with you. They will not be a disappointment. Their lives, their marriages will reveal to the whole world that you are still involved in this institution. And that through them indeed, the head of the serpent shall be crushed. And they will manifest your light all over to the glory and honor of your name. Thank you, Father. Thank you for our brethren who have shared. Lord, please preserve them. Their testimonies will grow and increase to the glory and honor of your name alone. 
We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.